Happy two one, and we're recording. I'm with Ryan. Ryan, how are you today? Great, man. Nice to, to uh, nice to be with you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Uh, Happy New Year! Just off the note, I know we had a you had a bit of a crowd cast thing going on about a week ago. Thanks for inviting me to that. That was really special. That was nice. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, a little little holiday cocktail hour, even though we can't physically get together. But we're gonna fix that hopefully later in the year. Cool, cool. Okay, so let's dive into it. Before we dive into it, I was going to say, the first question I'd like to kind of start with is when or approximately where we met. But it was probably around 20, what, 14, 15 time, right? Um, I think, so, maybe? Yeah, it, was, it was somewhere in there. You know, I, I think um, we met early on at, uh, at DCG. I can't remember when you guys came to visit. Um, but uh, it, was, it was in the late 2014, early 2015. Yeah, and and you've been you're like a pioneer in the space, and uh, and so one of my goals, I, I know right now, obviously there's a lot of hype and excitement around you know the all time highs and all that. Um, uh, however, however, I'm kind of interested more so in the stories, right? Like the mm-hmm. the stories of the people that yeah. have kind of led to this to occur, right? And to demystify some of that. Um, so 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 so, and you, like when I look at you, I think about you. I think about as someone who's obviously had a big impact on the space. So I know we have limited time. I wanted to first dive into. So I, I treat like the learning of Bitcoin a bit of as a singularity event, you know, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe not it is uh, for most people. But, but um, so I like to ask the question around, like, what is your story, I guess, prior to learning about Bitcoin and then uh, post uh, Bitcoin and then kind of, you know, just, just sharing the, the kind of the arc of, of Ryan's, mm-hmm. uh, Ryan's story. That, that, that's the first question. So let's maybe get started there and then we'll move into your company and all that. Sure. So, so I started in traditional finance, uh, uh-huh. banking uh, as a summer intern, and then actually got right into venture capital uh, after undergrad. Um, was very lucky because I came to the job market during the teeth of the recession, uh, mm. and and you know had a couple of friends from college that were able to pull some strings and, and get me a pretty uh, pretty good gig as a, as a VC associate. Um, that's uh, where I cut my teeth for the first three years, and then you know decided I want to be on the other side of the table and started a, a tech company focused on the, uh, on the charitable market. Mm. Um, we ran that for about two years. Uh, long story short, uh, we ran into a bunch of red tape in getting one of the critical components of the business approved. And uh, ironically, um, it was approved finally um, the day that I you know, kind of signed on for, for Digital Currency Group, which is like a year after I had already abandoned the idea and, uh, and got full-time in, into Bitcoin. Um, but uh, this was probably summer of 2013. I was going through uh, an accelerator program up, up in Boston with a bunch of other entrepreneurs and um, became clear that you know, we just weren't going to be able to launch. So um, the, uh, the fortuitous uh, accident of history was I ended up winding down my startup right around the same time um, that uh, I made my first Bitcoin purchase and the price went up by 6x. Uh, so I ended up, you know, going down the rabbit hole and, and doing more of a buy sell hold analysis uh, in uh, in late October. Uh, ended up liquidating my four hundred one k. Which year? Recommend. Which year was it? Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. Okay, okay, okay. Interesting. Um, so right, right before that big kind of first uh, public, you know, mm-hmm. profile uh, run up, and um, and so uh, apologies for the dog in the background. That's not usually a thing, um, but we have uh, we have some company. Uh, the the general um, sense that I had at the time was, you know, uh, the Winklevoss twins were launching their ETF. Fred Wilson was investing. Andreessen Horowitz had just uh, backed the Series B for Coinbase. So a lot uh-huh. of career risk was taken off the table. And uh, and I decided to skip business school, uh, skip any other plans for pursuing employment and, and just started writing full-time as an independent analyst with the, with the goal of ultimately uh, becoming a full-time contributor to the ecosystem. And lo and behold, Joined DCG in late 2014. That's where we met. Um, ran CoinDesk, and and uh, as of late 2017, um, have been uh, the founder and CEO of Masari. Okay, so um, okay, so interesting. Uh, that that's actually a lot. Um, any, I guess, I guess, just given you know Bitcoin and everything that's happening, curious, just what's been your relationship with that in terms of just like was it at first was it very kind of like hesitant like mess, most people was it uh, like I'm just wondering about like how your how, what your thought process was rather around it and and how you got to um, 
Because, I mean, you came across my radar first when you were writing some pretty prolific things way back in the day. Like, I think one of the mm -hmm. first big exchanges, uh, Gox or something like that, had gone down and, and you were yeah. you were doing some great reporting around that. And then, um, and then, but just curious, like, I mean, by then, it seemed like you were obviously very well versed in Bitcoin and kind of were deep down the rabbit hole. So but, but how, what did that look like in terms of, like, who brought it to your attention? Was it just something you picked up on the Internet or? Uh, well, I, I kind of had the um, the right philosophical leanings uh, to to you know take the red pill pretty quickly. Um, in 2011, I'd actually got my first exposure to Bitcoin. I didn't buy it, but I, I, I kind of heard about it for the first time, and uh, ended up you know buying gold and shorting the U.S. Treasury and, and ignoring Bitcoin, which is basically the only way that you could have um, been correct about that macro thesis, but not made any money. Um, so in 2013, when uh, there was a, a little bit more infrastructure in the industry and it was easier to acquire Bitcoin as a non-engineer, um, that's when you know I was able to get financial exposure, and then after financial exposure, you know, came the learning process. So um, I pretty much uh, because I was in between business school and shutting down a startup and not knowing you know, really what I wanted to do uh, in, in the interim 10 months, uh, started just full-time research and, and no one really had a good uh, digest of what was going on day-to-day -day in the industry. People were relying on Reddit or you know, Coindesk at that point was only a few months old. So uh, I, I pretty quickly got that you know, executive following uh, just through manual uh, additions to that mailing list and, and, you know, getting to know people at conferences. And, uh, and then, you know, once I broke the Mt. Gox story, you know, obviously, you know, for better and for worse, got to know everybody in the industry in pretty short order. So um, that was kind of the start of it. And, um, and, you know, six months after Gox, I joined, you know, Barry ATCG um, to, uh, to help with, uh, with investments and, and getting that business up and running from his prior company, Second Market. And, and Ryan, um, uh, you know, so one of my kind of themes is building on Bitcoin, right? So it's like, yeah, you can make money, you can buy it, hold it. There's this great, you know, hodling strategy and all that. Um, but what I find that there isn't a lot of kind of content or material around out there is, is this idea of that you can actually do things around it. You don't need to ask anyone. You can just get started. And you have been at the epicenter of that, uh, you know, now and, and really the, from the start of your career. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, were there any like common threads or things that you found amongst like entrepreneurs that you came across early on in this space that, that I don't know, I mean, that, that, that kind of would help someone who's maybe on the edge thinking like, hey, look, I could make a move in this space that are, that's on the edge of, you know, thinking of building a business in this space. Uh, any words that you might want to kind of share with them? Well, you know, I think you just have to make the, the leap, you, even if it's part time, um, having a, a concerted effort towards, you know, contributing to the ecosystem and, and re either researching it or contributing code. Um, I think, you know, there's nothing stopping anyone. And, and in fact, you know, we at Masari have rolled out a community analyst program that's now placed dozens of people in, in uh, various investment firms and, and infrastructure companies across the industry. Um, and they literally started with us just on a voluntary basis, contributing to this open research library. Um, countless examples of, of open source developers or part-time developers tinkering on a project and then, you know, ultimately having that either turn into a full-time, you know, position uh, somewhere or um, uh, leading to, you know, kind of startup financing. So I, I think uh, the the fact that this is an open uh, permissionless market is is you know obviously attractive um, from uh, across a variety of, of factors, but maybe the the most is important is just a, it's just a greenfield opportunity for career growth. Um, you just have to kind of pick a, a specialty and and you know start producing and and there's really nothing holding anyone back from doing so. And then, Ryan, your journey also has been fascinating in the sense that you were kind of, you know, helping a lot of entrepreneurs and then you shift gears in and, you know, launched your own project. Um, well, I guess what kind of key insight, what, you know, what, what did you see that, that maybe the market really needed that, that you felt that your, you know, you and your team could deliver on? Well, from, from day one, I've been on the research side of things. So, you know, whether it was independently um, or, you know, through Coindesk or, or not through Masari, um, I've always uh, had a, a, a skill set around producing high quality information for new, either a new audience or professional audience looking to enter the space. 
And, um, and so, you know, have continued to invest in that and, and kind of invest in, in teams and, and products that, that help support uh, better ed education and understanding of, of what's going on, you know, across this new frontier. Um, that uh, has basically been seven and a half years uh, of, of full-time work. I, I'd say, you know, even when I was on the investing side um, full-time, you know, it was still a DCG, which is, you know, uh, structured more like an index than a Series A investor, where they're taking you know big lead uh, positions. So it's it's a slightly different role, and, and even then, it was really about building a network and an information network at that. So um, you know, with with Masari, what we saw early on was that this is this was going to be about more than just Bitcoin and more than just Ethereum. It was going to be an explosion of, of assets and, and protocols that use tokens to align. Incentives in, in their relative uh, in their respective economies. Um, how do you actually you know dive down the Bitcoin rabbit hole? That's challenging enough for people you know that are coming into it from uh, for for the first time. But if you try to go from uh, from Bitcoin to Ethereum, that's even harder. If you try to go Bitcoin Ethereum and then try to grapple with the, the hundreds uh, of applications that are coming online in various stages of development, it's next to impossible. So you need you need a guide uh, and you need tools that are gonna help you kind of level up to um, go from zero to, you know, training wheels to, you know, riding the, uh, riding the, the, the dirt bike on the mountainous terrain. So, uh, yeah, that's awesome. So Ryan, you know, as, as you probably know, we were mostly focused on Bitcoin, you know, for the first part of our journey in India, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, more recently the market spoke. And so as a result, we also have uh, other assets that we offer through a, a, a decentral, uh, sorry, through a, an exchange itself, a centralized exchange. Um, so, so as traders, you know, get into this space more so, um, any kind of tips for them? And, 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 and I guess, I mean, Masari obviously would be a, a great resource for them. Um, but any, any kind of, uh, I don't know, in this crazy, insane market, um, just, it, it, yeah, in terms of, I mean, it's one of the biggest complaints I get is people are like, where do I learn things? Like, where do I go to get reliable information? And, and it's, it's frustrating because, you know, you leave it to the jungle of the internet and it's almost impossible. So, so yeah, just, uh, so, so as, again, as, as more new and new traders from other industries start to look at Bitcoin and come in, um, what, what do you, what do you say to them usually? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first of all, uh, I, I don't think we cater to traders. I'm not a trader uh, and, mm. and have never really, you know, claimed to be. Um, I tend to think, at least in the U.S., uh, trading is uh, is extremely difficult to do profitably um, because, uh, first of all, you're trading against uh, pretty, uh, pretty experienced and knowledgeable professionals. Um, second of all, uh, you often don't have the right information asymmetries working on your side uh, versus against mm -hmm. you. And, uh, and third of all, the buy and hold strategy for assets that move in parabolic fashion um, is, is far superior from a tax standpoint often than, um, than you know, just trying to trade in and out and, and each year just accumulating these um, these these income uh, tax hits that, uh, that that inevitably people get blindsided by when the market corrects and all of a sudden they've got more tax liability than um, than, than they even made in the first place. Mm. So um, I I tend to you know recommend that people are you know obviously do their research and, and think you know carefully. But if they're going to invest you know uh, unless you're a professional trader you know more often than not you you want to just kind of buy and then sit tight. And and this 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 because uh, this notion that like now institutions are coming in, you know, I, I mean, I think you know, home offices and hedge funds, they've been you know now nibbling uh, or you know kind of getting into Bitcoin in a more serious way, you could say. But um, but now there's this narrative around how large institutions and pension funds and you know these uh, are you are you uh, buying into this narrative? Are you also seeing that this is happening, or is it still uh, you know uh, talk? Um, no, I, I I think it's definitely happening. It's it's happening in 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 you know drips and drops, but um, you know those drips and drops when you're talking about the amount of money uh, in play are, are significant by you know historical standards for the industry. So um, I don't think we've seen uh, the real uh, deluge yet. I think you know that's the, that could be coming, or or you know it, it's um, something that you know we might expect to see in the cycle, but. Um, I think the only real remaining uncertainty um, for you know the industry right now uh, this year is around how the new 
administration in the U.S. is going to um, view crypto assets and, and, and regulation of crypto assets. Um, I my my sense is that um, if you know the new administration uh, you know takes takes office in a couple of weeks here, and it looks like um, the worst regulatory impulses of the previous uh, administration are are kept in check. Yeah. Then you know I, I'd imagine that's going to be a pretty positive uh, institutional catalyst for the rest of the year. Um, even still, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin is about more than just kind of the for better or for worse, right? Uh, it, it's about more than just you know its original cypherpunk ideals, and uh, and because it's gotten you know very suit and tie, uh, that could mean massive you know appreciations in value, even if it comes at the cost of privacy and, and some of the original. Um, uh, you know, valuable aspects of, of, of Bitcoin. And, and I mean, you know, the, the kind of the, what, what is your thought about like privacy and Bitcoin though? Like, isn't it, it wasn't the whole narrative always like, well, Bitcoin's open source. So, you know, it could at- essentially adopt the best elements of any other chain, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that that narrative is maybe, uh, you know, not going to happen anymore because of some of the regulatory pushback that we're seeing now with the travel rule and some of these initiatives that are happening globally? Um, you know, I, I, I think Bitcoin is very hard to change, period. Uh, so I don't, I don't think um, that Bitcoin is going to react to the protocol that is, I don't think is, is going to react um, very quickly to, to regulations one way or the other. The uh, entity supporting Bitcoin may. So, you know, if there were efforts to um, uh, create confidential transactions by default, incorporate some of the, the um, more uh, bulletproof privacy um, features that, that have been released in you know, various projects over the course of the last few years, I think that'd be tough to get incorporated into Bitcoin at this point, because it would uh, also make it difficult for exchanges and the regulated edges that are, are kind of lion's share of um, volume for the industry. It'd be tough for them to support an asset that, that made that type of um, you know, major uh, privacy upgrade. So, you know, to me, I, um, I think the, level of um, staticness, stasis uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, in, in the industry is, is you know, one, of its, um, one of its strengths, but it's also an opportunity for other smaller projects to you know, innovate a little bit more nimbly and, and you know, maybe find product market fit in, um, in areas that are either complementary or, or you know, p- potential long-term substitutes for Bitcoin. Um, I tend to think that you know, Bitcoin is gonna be the lead horse for um, the foreseeable future, if not forever. Um, but, you know, everything is the, uh, is the winning asset until it's not. So it remains to be seen if anything could possibly catch up. I think it's good for the industry if it's just Bitcoin in the lead right now, because uh, everything else can, uh, you know, remain on the, uh, on the periphery and, and, and kind of compete for their own unique uh, use cases and, and feature sets. Uh, yeah, interesting. Hey, Ryan, just curious. Um, you know, I am from Toronto, so I actually I was kind of like I had a front row seat to the whole Ethereum uh, movement, if you will, right? And uh, so, just uh, just curious, you know, um, to think about like you, you know, again, has your thesis around uh, Ethereum changed at all over the years, or were you always uh, like kind of is it something you've been skeptical about, or are you more um, open to it now? I mean, like I, just on a personal note, I I, I was very skeptical about it. But I've been, you know, I feel like perhaps I've been proven wrong on several fronts. Well, I, I wouldn't say um, I was. I was skeptical uh, about the asset early on, um, and the reason was it seemed like you only needed um, one money-like currency to uh, to you know ultimately power decentralized applications. So you could use Ethereum smart programming language, but you could use Bitcoin as like the underlying asset. And, and you know, one asset would, would accrue the lion's share of, of the monetary premium. And to a certain extent, that, that actually has been true. Um, but uh, as Ethereum usage increased and as gas um, usage increased, you know, I tended to think you could look at Ethereum just like any other, you know, cash producing utility. And, um, and in fact, you know, as a, a multiple of, of network earnings, network fees, um, it, 
it still makes sense as an investment now, right? Even if you think that it's not money. So uh, for, for me, the early skepticism was, um, how do you solve the cold start problem? How do you actually get people using some of these decentralized applications? Like what are mm. gonna be the bleeding edge apps that take this um, from a toy to something that's actually useful and, and produces real value for investors? Um, and I think that's been the biggest change in the last couple of years is uh, it's, you know, Ethereum is not an, a, a reserve currency for ICOs anymore. And ICOs were mostly fundraising schemes with nothing to back them up. Today, Ethereum is the settlement layer for decentralized finance and DeFi applications are actually being used for things like lending, exchange, uh, synthetic asset issuance, and, and you know, a whole suite of other uh, types of assets and applications, you can actually wrap your head around and see you know, real value there. So to, um, to the extent that my, uh, my mind has changed about Ethereum, uh, and this has really been true since early 2017, so it's, it's, it's not as if I you know, have been completely you know, uh, skeptical and, and, and naysaying about uh, Ethereum. You know, I think I, right before the ICO boom, it became obvious that, that there was critical mass developing on the network. Um, my uh, enthusiasm, uh, I guess you could think of it almost like I got excited at the Series A, not the seed. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, right, like there's a few proof points and, and they made it out of the cradle. And, and so, you know, I didn't, make, uh, I didn't make money from the ICO price, but, um, but you know, I, there was still a lot of value to capture between, you know, low double digits, high single digits, and, uh, and where we are today over a thousand. And Ryan, have you heard of RSK? Um, I, I find it, I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit puzzled yeah. as to why that project, I don't hear more about it. I mean, I, I love those guys and I've interviewed them and all that, but uh, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts around it? Is, it? is it the centralization? Is it just that it doesn't maybe jive with the Bitcoin culture as much? I don't know, like, what is it? Uh, honestly, I, I have no idea, but but hmm. um, things like RSK and uh, and Blockstream's, you know, uh, side chains and, right. and you know, those type of applications were exactly why I thought that Bitcoin would probably, you know, capture the, the lion's share of value when it comes to uh, digital currencies. Um, that was disproven, I think, in part because of uh, the wildly different values between two communities, uh, between Ethereum and, and, and Bitcoin early on. So um, it, it almost made sense just for cultural reasons that, that a different you know, type of reserve asset was was used and uh, proliferated for Ethereum applications, and, and that it didn't necessarily stick as well with Bitcoin because Bitcoiners were really still about sound money, and um, and this digital gold narrative and, and settlement narrative. Um, so you know, I, I guess uh, you know, I don't I don't know a whole lot. Uh, I mean, I know the guys, but I don't know a whole lot about like what Rootstock has been up to, RSK has been up mm. to. Um, uh, nor do you know any of the other smart contract uh, platforms building on Bitcoin, but you know I I almost feel like it doesn't matter uh, at this point because so much infrastructure has been built up around the Ethereum ecosystem um, that you know it is as or probably more secure and easier to build in that environment than it would be to port everything back to, to Bitcoin. And then that, just to rewind on that institutional um, narrative that we were touching on, is that something that also do you think, do you, or do you think institutions are not even thinking about Ethereum or are they kind of nibbling at the edges now too going, okay, well, if we're going to think about Bitcoin, then maybe we should be thinking about this whole asset class or, or is it, you know, something different like, or just, I mean, just, I know no one really knows, but uh, just generally. Yeah. I mean, I guess it could happen at some point. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, mm. I, I I tend to think that Bitcoin is going to lead um, when it comes to institutions, and uh, it will be the kind of gateway drug for institutions uh, when it comes to digital currencies, the same way that it was for uh, most retail investors and most tinkerers. And, and so, Ryan, just to kind of get back to your, uh, I guess, like Masari, in, in like in terms of you know a develop like not a developer but like a builder um you know what what how do you guys go about thinking about you know i guess not just finding product market fit because that's obviously happened but you know kind of scaling and, and struggling with some of these challenges i'm sure you guys are probably dealing with now uh 
so sorry, how, how we deal with yeah. the challenge of scaling period. Or, so or, yeah, or, like, is that, yeah. is that something, I mean, now I'm like, I mean, like you heard yesterday, right? All the major exchanges were down at one point, I think. I mean, there is, uh, I know at our website, it's just insane right now. There's just a lot of traffic, but just curious, like, I mean, you guys are more even of a face to the industry, right? Than, than exchanges. So just curious, like how is, how is it all holding up for you guys? <laughs> Uh, well, so far so good. I mean, we we're also uh, not at the level of like a Coin Market Cap or Coin Gecko, so you know mm. we don't face nearly the same level of strain uh, right now. Since our fo- our focus is on you know professionals and uh, and enterprises, so just by definition, we're not going to have the same eyeballs on site as as some of the retail focused ranking sites are. Um, but uh, you know, even even still, you know, last month was. Uh, even normalized for the the traffic spikes that other um, information businesses experienced, uh, we we had a, a, a record month. Just you know, kind of blew things out, and we're on pace to do so again this month. Again, even normalizing for the rally. So uh, I think you know part of that's a testament to some of the new products that we've shipped, um, and uh, and and just you know greater professional and, and enterprise interest versus just the retail interest. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just, to, I know you, you're, you're a bit tight on time. So I wanted to uh, just maybe switch gears here and um, yeah, I just ask you this question, which is a bit of a twist on Peter Thiel's, you know, contrarian question, which is, you know, what is one truth that you hold that you think most others, you know, in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Um, that's a good question. I, um, I think I don't even know if this is contrarian anymore. I I, I still um, struggle with what happens once the Bitcoin fees uh, decline past a certain threshold. Uh, the and the the kind of annualized minor awards are now below the two percent target inflation rate of the Fed. It's it's kind of closer on par to annual supply increase in the in the gold market. Um, but you know, at the next halving. When we're in the you know half percent range, uh, it, you're you're going to need to see a healthy fee market uh, materialize that um, that offsets uh, the loss in income for miners. Otherwise, network security becomes an issue. So I, I probably think that the um, the long term network health uh, of of Bitcoin is is still very much an open question. And it's not really anything to do with the concentration of mining capacity. You know, that's that's not great from a ge- geopolitical standpoint. But um, really, uh, w- what the issue boils down to is um, how do you make sure that miners are are incentivized to um, not attack the network and and actually you know keep operating uh, at scale uh, and and not do funky things with uh, transactions. Uh, once we kind of transition from the seniors model to uh, to a fee model. Interesting, interesting. And Ethereum oh. has solved this, um, but you know Ethereum has other issues uh, like migrating to an entirely new blockchain. Uh, so if they if if you know ETH to ETH two does complete that transition, you know you, you could say that Ethereum is arguably in a more secure long term state than Bitcoin. Even um, there's still quite a bit of, uh, of of work that's going to go into that migration though. Right, right, right. Exactly. Um, interesting. Interesting. Okay, so I wanted to just share one thing real quick with you. So I, I had a chance to be at the OECD um, uh, blockchain event last year in Paris. And mm-hmm. it was literally when the whole Libra thing was breaking. And um, and it was fascinating to be in a room. And they actually had somebody from Facebook speak on stage in front of 2,000, you know, regulators. And mm-hmm. it, was, it was very interesting to see that gentleman kind of articulate. And I always felt that that was kind of a, a big move moment mainly because um you know bitcoin you can choose to not care about it but facebook is already on your phone whether you're a regulator or a mom or a dad it doesn't matter who you are you got facebook so so people were forced to think about this and it it was kind of a shot fired and then i felt like the cbdc thing came about and and in some ways if you think deeply about that that disintermediates banks because now central banks can relate directly with the consumer through these CBDCs. And then more recently, the OCC news came out where the banks or the banking regulators in the United States at least have said, hey, now we can deal with Bitcoin and Ethereum and these types of technologies as a, is it, maybe I'm butchering this, but as a SWIFT-like network, is that correct? Or 
Is that kind of, um, is that, is that what's, is that what's happening? Like I'm trying to figure out what's actually happening here. And is the next play maybe central bank saying we're going to hold, you know, Bitcoin or something like that on their balance sheets is like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly think that we'll see central banks hold Bitcoin. Um, there's a big difference between uh, central banks creating their own CBDCs, which will take a very long time. Um, and, uh, and, and then actually just holding Bitcoin as a reserve asset. And you know, with um, with the dollar kind of decoupling and and uh, becoming uh, slowly um, uh, removed from certain countries' uh-huh. uh, foreign reserve uh, baskets, I think uh, there's limited places that people can turn. You know, you can turn to gold reserves, you can turn to a basket like Libra um, or you know the the SDRs from the from the International Monetary Fund. Um, I think more and more you'll see at least a portion of balance sheets going into Bitcoin. And if you think about weaker economies or ones where they don't really have uh, a whole lot of leeway in terms of how they expand uh, their, their money supply or how they manage you know, fiscal um, challenges associated with things like the global slowdown with COVID, um, it, makes it, it almost makes sense to take a flyer, right? If you start to see inflation um, tick up in your currency and you know that um, there are you know few avenues out other than you know sustained inflation and, uh, and kind of the in- inability to really uh, manage your own budgets at scale uh, you know why, why wouldn't you put a, a certain percentage you know one percent five percent ten percent of your reserves into something that's inflation resistant because um, you've got at worst uh, something that is going to decline along with the value of the rest of your currency that reserves. Um, at best, you know, you can uh, all of a sudden go from maybe a flailing central bank into one that has a very robust balance sheet if this cycle persists and, and we see, you know, a, a 10x from here in, in the price of Bitcoin, for instance. So uh, I, I, frankly, I'd be surprised if there hasn't been at least some uh, central bank purchasing uh, behind the scenes of, of Bitcoin at this point, not, you know, U.S. Treasury, but maybe smaller central banks. Um, I think that we'll hear the first stories of that sometime this year. I forget what the country was, but somebody, because I was talking about this and somebody said, Sonny, did you hear Iran? And I think it was another country. They, they started doing this and I almost fell off my chair, but it'll probably start, you know, not with, you know, the United States or, or you know, or, or any sort of like major economy. It might might start more at, kind of at the edges, right? I think it was yep. Venezuela. Was the, oh, I actually, well, I don't know if it was true or not, but I saw pictures of like the Venezuelan government people putting together Bitcoin miners. And, and in fact, uh, uh, just just on a, just on a uh, slight side note, um, I, the reason I started doing this podcast, my first podcast, like this is I think almost sixty, it was uh, because of two guys that I met in Toronto that were from Venezuela, that one of whom was persecuted by the the government. He was literally at one of my Toronto Bitcoin events when he got a call from his lawyer in Venezuela saying um, an, an arrest was just warranted for your, I mean, a uh, warrant was just, uh, you know, is out for your arrest, like don't come back type of deal. And, and, and like, I think I cried the first time, like I actually heard the full story of like what was going on in Venezuela and how Bitcoin was actually not just like a NGU saying it was like, like stay mm-hmm. alive thing. Uh um, and, and do you think, I mean, I know there's a lot of, again, in, interest and excitement of the price and et cetera, et cetera, but, but do you think about that much nowadays? Like, you know, just kind of the more, you know, the, the life-saving quality of Bitcoin, the, the, that, and, and you feel like, I don't know, maybe people, a lot of people are missing that. Um, or do you think people are getting that in a big way? Um, I, I think it's not just about Venezuela, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about a, uh, I think the need for a global life raft, mm. the situations in, in some emerging economies and some distressed uh, countries like Venezuela uh, hint at, at kind of a broader sea change that it seems like it's inevitable. And this is something that I think most early adopters of Bitcoin, um, it, it, it kind of really resonated early on because of the long-term fear many of us had uh, with respect to how governments were managing their finances and uh, and how currencies are being debased uh, really in mass. So uh, Venezuela is an extreme example, but look, this has happened in, in Argentina for, for decades, uh, massive currency devaluations that have, that have significantly impacted um, the, uh, the lives of the people that live there. 
Uh, this is happening right now in Turkey, in Iran, in um, India to a much lesser extent, but you know, it's not like inflation doesn't exist today. Um, there's, there's plenty of um, kind of massive life-saving ability like Venezuela and, uh, and, and then you know, more minor uh, life-enhancing uh, capabilities of, of, of owning a inflation-resistant asset. Now, the question is, um, at what point do people in certain countries take the volatility risk because their currencies are so risky to hold outright. And maybe one of the most meaningful developments of this year hasn't been like micro strategy in the US putting its own its, its entire treasury into Bitcoin. Mm. Instead, it's been um, the uh, companies, the mass mutuals of the world squares that are thinking about the support of a portfolio now, right? A, a, an inflation hedge so that if the entire basket of, of, your, um, of your treasury declines in purchasing power, you have something that's rising in purchasing power, or at least like one 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 hedge against that to, to keep yourself mm -hmm. running in place um, beyond just what what speculators are doing. I don't know how many individuals are doing that, but you know that's certainly the recommendation that I think most people give is you know buy uh, buy Bitcoin with one percent of your assets, right? That's that's kind of the quip that everybody's always said. Yeah, um, and uh, and and just hold it as as long term insurance. Well, well, okay. I thought we were going to go with this. Is Michael? So we brought up Michael Saylor. He in a recent interview, he was saying he's like, we're, we've just gone from one percent of the one percent to like fifty percent of everything, or something like that. Um, this this notion that Bitcoin is this like this engineered treasury asset um, that the world's waking up to. Do you think there's something there? I mean, that that's kind of a that that's like a that's that's a, that's like a oh that, that's like an order of magnitude different, right? Because I mean, I get your one percent. That's the black swan, Nassim Taleb. I mean, that that's kind of the <clears throat> the the strategy I you know suggest to friends and say, look, just you know get one percent exposure. But now it's almost like it sounds like something's flipping, no? Or is just, is it just me? <laughs> Well, we're, we're certainly entering, I think, the first phase of, of a new cycle of growth. We'll see if, you know, the historical patterns repeat. I, I tend to think the, um, the only thing that's going to slow uh, Bitcoin down is some uh, very highly negative regulatory action uh, and or some type of disaster, right? So if, if things um, don't completely unravel uh, in, uh, in the, the broader world, uh, I think you know Bitcoin should do very well just because it's a it's a uh, narrative and a meme whose time has come. And I think you know more people than ever are able to gravitate to Bitcoin as the starting point um, and uh, and and rally around this digital gold narrative um, that just you know hasn't really been top of mind in previous cycles. I think last year's uh, QE and, and everything that happened uh, around COVID really brought that into uh, stark contrast. Uh, not just you know what the impact was last year of money printing, but basically what the new normal is in terms of of you know uh, debt monetization and and uh, and money printing on, on just a, a, a an enormous global scale. Yeah. Oh, um Okay, so just uh, just to kind of round uh, finish up, uh, I, there was a few things I wanted to just quickly ask you on um, AI. Uh, do you, first of all, do you think about this much? Is, is it something that comes across your radar? And when I say AI, just to qualify the question, I don't mean like, uh, like a Tesla is an AI, Bitcoin is AI. I'm talking about this thing that, you know, Elon and Zuckerberg and these guys are talking about this more, um, perhaps like sentient general AI that, uh, might be super cheap and capable of doing everything. Um, is, is that something you think is, I don't know, do you think it's first of all a threat or not? Um, well, or... you know, to, to be honest, I don't really, uh, I don't really think about it because you go nuts thinking about things like that. I think, <laughs> you know, first of all, I can't control it. Uh, second mm. of all, I can't really capitalize on it at this point. And, um, and third of all, it's depressing to think about the, the, the scenario. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. I, I don't really know how you can slow people down from, uh, from, from innovating and, and using certain technologies like that. So um, if, uh, if there is, uh, if there are benefits to using AI, uh, I think they're going to be exploited uh, at, at kind of massive scale in, in the coming years and decades. 
companies already are doing that and investing heavily in it. Um, but in terms of like general intelligence, that seems like it's still a ways off. Um, but, and uh, you know, one, we, one, like sorry, we, sorry. we might not even we might not even know when it gets here, and it's going to be too late at that point. So it'd be like getting hit by a meteor. And so, so I agree. I think I think we're pretty far off from from that. But 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 before that, even I mean, like I said, Tesla, uh, it drives itself. The car literally drives itself. So it, it is foreseeable that even in the short term, that we do see massive, you know, I guess you could say job loss, right? Um, do you think that's like of concern, or are you of the more the you know nature that you know humans always kind of figure out a way, and that's Luddite thinking? Um. Again, I, you know, uh, I, I have such limited control uh, over over those things that I, I try not to spend time worrying or thinking, thinking about too it too much about things that I have no absolutely no control over. Um, you know, I I don't see any scenario where the pace of innovation slows down, um, mm -hmm. regardless of of you know whether people want to restrict the growth of. Uh, technology or or kind of curb innovation, um, there are always going to be people pushing the envelope, and and more often than not, it's going to be for for the better versus versus the worse. So, um, yeah, we'll 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 see. Uh, I think there are many other technologies out, outside of AI that are uh, within my uh, core uh, competencies and, and ability to you know kind of have some type of impact around, mm -hmm. uh, like crypto, and 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 so you know I. I I keep my my mental <laughs> energy there to the extent possible. Uh, it sounds good, man. So, okay, so just if people want to, I guess, learn about uh, your company, the domain, and also, you know, where they kind of can plug into your conscious consciousness, like your Twitter feed or your blog, or sure. where do people learn about you? Yeah, so uh, masari.io is the site. I encourage people uh, that are actively looking at, uh, at crypto assets, especially beyond just Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, to uh, to try this out as, as your second screen. You can create custom watch lists. You can, uh, without ever leaving the homepage, toggle between different sector views, uh, charting views, uh, look at, at various on-chain fundamentals, and, uh, and catch the, the daily news, uh, which I curate uh, every morning uh, through uh, through kind of a top 10 uh, bulleted list of, of the news items that you might have missed from the day before. So we do not have an editorial desk, but my, uh, my daily newsletter, along with our, our analyst research, is available if you subscribe right there on the homepage. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan. I know you're a busy guy. So thank you for making this time for me. And I guess we'll just Always, bring it to, man. and we'll just bring it to a close. Uh, all right. Thanks.